We are approaching the end of our explanation about how to write a good lab report and as such we are here to talk about the conclusion. This ties in with the, one of the last steps of scientific method where you basically are going to be interpreting what the meaning of these results and tying it in with basically what you've learned from your experiment. So these are the criteria that I'll be looking for for when you're writing your conclusion. You should start with the conclusion statement and we talked about this we did a uh, nature of science lecture series and we talked about the fact that you can never really say in science that you confirm or support something. This is very important. In science we're uh, never willing to say that we found the truth, that this is the definitive, this is what it is. Instead we looked, we are more open-minded and say that this is the best that we know so far based on the evidence that was collected and based on the instruments that we had available at the time. And so instead of saying that we, the hypothesis was confirmed, the hypothesis was supported, uh, you say the results either rejected hypothesis, which is what you would say in case that you know they contradicted what you thought was hap was going to happen, or that they failed to reject hypothesis. So instead of saying supported, you say failed to reject. That, that gives you the idea that you know you're not right, you're just not wrong for now. So you should begin your conclusion with a statement like that, where you just basically say the results rejected or failed to reject hypothesis that, and then you restate the hypothesis. That should be like your every conclusion begins with. Then after that, you should uh, follow that with um, explanation about why you're saying this. What is it about the results that make you say that the hypothesis was rejected or failed to be rejected? You're not really restating the results, you're explaining uh, what about the results makes you think that this is the best conclusion that you can make. So you are interpreting the results, basically. Then. After that, you should try to see if there are other studies where your results pretty much were followed. In other words, are there other studies that uh, said the same thing? Uh, you can compare that with a classmate or with something else that you found online, that uh, research paper where it was about the same thing. You know, so you compare your findings with the findings of other people. Was it like the other people or not like other people's findings? And then after that, you should be ready to, to infer as to why you think the results turned out the way they did. So you're not, you're not really interpreting the results here, you're explaining the results here. What you're saying here is basically, I think it, this happened because my rationale for the by background was correct. Or if it went against your hypothesis, it was the opposite of what you expected, you're going to have to come up with some sort of explanation to say, how come the results did not come out the way you expected? Uh, maybe now I need to do a new hypothesis, what would that possibly be? Or maybe there was some sort of mistake that I've done, all that kind of stuff. Which brings me to the next thing you should be doing. You should always look, even if the results did fail to reject your hypothesis, you should still always look for limitations. Sources of errors that could be in your experiment. There's a video that I did as an extra video. You don't really have to watch it for class, but it's a good video to make you think about things that could go wrong about in experiments. So look for source of errors and its limitations. I'm looking for more than one here. And you should also try to uh, describe how do you think that these sources of errors may have affected your results. And then how do you think that you could have changed things in a future experiment maybe to avoid those limitations that you had in this study. What could have you done if you had the power to do it to change it to make it better basically. And then you also should suggest based on what you've learned from your experiment applications to use this in real life. Remembering, of course, what we talked about in the science, uh, Nature of Science lecture series, that how much generalization you can make from your experiment depends on how closely your experiment mimics the conditions that exist in the real life. So, but remember that whatever you did learn from what you, what you learned, try to generalize it. Try to say, this is how science could use this. This is how society could use this. Always important to put that in your conclusion. And also to suggest further directions for study. Maybe another experiment that can be done to explore the same topic or another topic that you thought about exploring after you've concluded learning about this experiment. These are the essential parts that you should have on a conclusion. If you write all of this within your conclusion, you should do just fine. So let's look at our sample along with the rubric to see if uh, the person did that. Okay, so according to the rubric, the first thing you should see is a conclusion statement that uses the proper language. Rejected or failed to reject the hypothesis. Followed by an explanation about what about the results made you reject or failed to reject the hypothesis. So going back to our example, that's exactly what she does. She says the results failed to reject the hypothesis that the closer a tomato plant's environment is to neutral acidity, the more it will grow. So this is the restating of the hypothesis right here. So this right here is the restating of her hypothesis and she starts with the proper structure by saying the results failed to reject the hypothesis. Right after she explains why she's saying it failed to reject the hypothesis because the plants exposed to acidic solutions did not grow but the control group 
and a neutral acidity showed growth. So she's, she's saying why uh, the, the where results are saying that the hypothesis uh, could, not, could not be rejected, you know? Then the next thing that you should do, according to the rubric, should be to compare your results to similar investigations, followed, all right, followed by an explanation of limitations um, The next thing is that the rubric says is that you should compare your results with other similar investigations. If you see here, she does not do that. So she should lose that point because she never goes by and says, uh, classmates found similar things or we found other websites uh, with uh, uh, projects posted with similar results or something like that. Uh, next thing that you should do is explain uh, a possible inference, explain why the results happened the way they did. Again, she does not explain this. Although she goes on to talk about some of the limitations that she, she had, she never really explains how come the acid made the plant grow less. You know, it's the same problem that she had in the background. She did not fully explain the rationale behind uh, her hypothesis. And here again, she does not restate that rationale to explain why this is happening the way that it's happening. And she should add that. She would have said something like, you know, uh, the acid... Uh, um, made sure that the enzymes inside the, the plant were damaged and then the chemical reactions could not happen and the plant could not grow as much and in a neutral environment that did not happen. So that lack of explanation is very very bad. You always should basically restate the principles that were in your background here and if your results were rejected, you know, in other words, if your hypothesis was not supported by the, the, the data, if your hypothesis was definitely uh, contradicted by the data, then you should try to come up with some sort of explanation as to why do you think that happened. The next thing is that you should suggest limitations with explanations about how those limitations could have possibly affected the results and suggestions on how to address those limitations on future experiments. She does suggest one limitation, which is about uh, keeping it far from the sunlight, and that may have affected how much the plant grows and introduce bias into the experiment. And then she, expect, she explains how that bias was introduced and how she could address that in the next experiment. The problem here is that she only did one limitation. And when I say limitations, I expect more than one. So she will lose both points here. She will lose uh, C5 and C6 because you have to have more than one limitation. She could have said a lot more. For example, the way that she measured the pH was with a cabbage pH indicator. And although a very creative and simple way to do it, especially if you're a student, that's a limitation because it's not a very precise way of measuring uh, what, you, what the pH was. Likewise, she, the way that she measured the height of the plant was never clearly indicated, so we can't be sure that she accurately measured the height in every, say, across every single group. Uh, we can never, she never really measured if these tomato plants were growing before uh, the the experiment actually started. So you can't really say that uh, it was it was the experiment that made them die. Maybe the plants were already on their way to die. So maybe a repeated measures experiment would have been better. Uh, watch the video lecture series on the nature of science for more information about that. Okay, so you see that you should have limitations and you should have your creativity used here to find problems. And a good way of doing that is that everything that happens in an experiment you write down and you keep that journal. At the end, it's useful to look at that journal to see if there's any things that you may have done that may include uh, cause the problems in the experiment. She did a good job with the limitations that she did include, but the problem is that she did not include more than one limitation. Now, directions for applications of results. How can we use these results in real life? She does mention a little bit about this experiment, uh, something about Florida and stuff, but she doesn't really tie in what she learned with this experiment with real life. She doesn't really talk about you know, it says, the experiment can be applied to real life by showing the impact of acid rain on a larger scale like an entire forest. Okay, so what would be the impact? You know, how does this, what did you learn from this? What would happen to the forest? You know, you never elaborated enough here. You know, you should have said, she should have said, you know, just like the tomato plants died when they were exposed to acidic solutions, likewise, acid rain would probably affect the growth of the, of the plants in real life. So the pollution that we are putting in the environment could ultimately cause natural habitats far away from where the pollution is actually coming from, where the rain actually falls, to end up dying. That is something crucial that's missing here, the application, what you learn from this, and then basically also that we know, therefore, we have to reduce the pollution that we emit. So that is missing. It's a very important thing. A good conclusion should be a lot longer than this. And that's probably why also this is bad uh, in losing points. Now, the last one is 
future research suggestions, something that you could do uh, to expand on this experiment or to continue studying the topic or to study another topic that you thought about while you were uh, looking at this one. And she says on the last thing that the experiments should feed the plants every two days instead of every three days to have a clear visualization of the different types of solutions are if the different types of solutions are the primary cause for the plant's height. So she's she's saying that uh, basically she's introducing yet another limitation perhaps. It, this is not really a suggestion for a future experiment. What I'm looking here is something like, okay, oh fine, now I understood what uh, acid rain is all about. Maybe next time I actually try to create acid rain, uh, some sort of a model of acid rain, uh, create pollutants in a bigger container, and and then make introduce a vapor, and then make sure water vapor, and then that will fall down as rain, and then we'll see the, how that that happens. You know, I'm tr what I'm trying to say here is that she didn't really mimic acid rain. She she said she she directly added acid to the roots. It didn't make a rain on the plants, and that could be different. And so she could mimic something like that. She could also see different kinds of acid. She could use acids which are, are more like the real acid that's in the acid rain instead of vinegar. Um, she could also explore other aspects about pollution, uh, you know, things like global warming. Future directions to experiments are not exactly to fix your experiment. That's the part of the limitations and solving the limitations. Future direction for experiments is other experiments that you can do to explore the same topic further or other topics that you thought about that are related to this topic that you want to examine because you now learned this topic. That is how you write a conclusion, and I hope yeah, this is clear enough for you.